there. Um, as usual, this is what I say every time, please let me know you're here by typing something in the comments, because otherwise I won't know you're here. If you just give me the thumbs up or a heart, I won't know that you're here. Um, and not that it matters if you want to lurk and be uh, anonymous, that's okay too, but I just like to know who I'm talking to. And I really like the comments. So, um, okay, New Orleans tour guide stories. We're kind of doing these sporadically right now with the hopes of eventually turning it into a regular thing, but I'm just got to try to figure out some kind of schedule or something. Gary, yay, Gary's here. Thank you. And thanks for your recommendation. Um, as you can see, oh, wrong side. As you can see, it's hard to do this. I uh, purchased the, um, instead of the 14 day free trial, I went and made it official. So I've got my logo up here, Lucky Bean Tours. So everybody will know. Uh, oh, there's Chrissy watching with Trisco. Oh yeah, okay, the um, the cocktail hour, right? <laughs> so everybody's having a good time, uh, making the most out of this crazy time and it's Saturday night. And I am going to talk a little bit about um, the Garden District tonight. So almost every single one of these that I've done, it's not been so much about the French Quarter, but um, sort of focused on the French Quarter. And I wanted to get out of the French Quarter a little bit and talk a little bit about the Garden District just because it is so interesting. So for anybody that's listening or gonna listen to this who um, doesn't really know New Orleans that well, the Garden District is another beautiful neighborhood that's kind of upriver from the French Quarter. So the French Quarter is the one with Jackson Square and Bourbon Street and all of that stuff that everybody loves uh, and visits every time that they come here. But there's lots and lots of really fascinating, interesting neighborhoods in New Orleans. And hopefully we'll get to explore all of those in the coming months because it's really not going to be um, possible for me to give the tours the way that I usually give them. So this is the way that we tell stories for now. Anyway, the Garden District is one of those neighborhoods that's upriver from New Orleans. And it really has just as fascinating history as, yay, Elliot's here, as, um, as any of the other neighborhoods of New Orleans. But it is a very different history. So I figured that we would um, kind of talk about this history, this history now. So let me try to share my screen. This is always where I get, okay, where I get kind of, um, gosh, they're just showing stream. Oh, there we go. Okay. So there we are, History of the Garden District. I'm going to make myself small, a little bit smaller over here. Um, and it's just not small enough. Can I do this? No. Nope. Oh, well, here I am once again, working my way through this thing. Um, the Garden District, and this is a beautiful home in the Garden District, the sort of uh, porch, and it's actually um, a house, the Mousson house is what we call it. It's on Third Street in the Garden District. And this is just the close up of the ironwork. So mostly we think about the ironwork as being part of the French Quarter, and it is. I mean, the French Quarter, that's exact, that's where uh, past iron, which is what this is, was introduced to New Orleans, was in the French Quarter. But by the 1880s, specifically the 1884 World's Fair, which was seen as something that was going to pull us out of the doldrums created by the Civil War. We were still impoverished, you know, after this, this war that we had lost. And so the idea behind any place that's had an Olympics or a World's Fair or a Super Bowl even has experienced this sort of feeling like, yay, it was going to put us in a big time and everybody's going to come look in and we're going to get rich. And so it didn't happen. It was pretty much a flop. Uh, however, we have lots of legacies from that time. And one of them is that people were kind of upgrading their homes. And this was sort of the type of ironwork that was kind of identified with New Orleans. It was almost one of the first examples of giving the tourist what they expect, even though it's not maybe what we really are. So we're, we're, we're guilty of that sometimes too. Uh, anyway, so the Garden District begins like all of these stories begin, which is, um, and let me see if I can switch this around so you can know, I'm trying to make you see more of this, but I just, maybe if I just go side by side for now. So uh, the garden district was this, um, the whole area was inhabited by various tribes of the Choctaw nation. And the river was the most important part of dictated what you did throughout your life, throughout the year, because we would go with the, the rising and the falling of the river. When the river was high, you know, we could catch a lot of fish and shellfish. When the river was low, then that meant it had left behind um, all of these fertile lands in which we could grow anything. 
and the people lived by the river. Sometimes they didn't live there permanently because it did flood every couple of years, but there was all of these native tribes along the Mississippi River, um, several different nations. And so this picture kind of shows how they were different colors, slightly different dress because it was several um, nations, uh, several different tribes of the Choctaw Nation. So anyway, um, this picture is depicts at post French contact because this native person is carrying a gun. And then this depicts when the French arrive here in New Orleans. Uh, and this is 1682, a French Canadian fur trader slash adventurer slash uh, failed priest and farmer, um, La Salle, uh, Rene Robert La Salle, comes down the river in 1682 and he plants this cross in the ground and he proclaims this great river and all the lands that drain into it for France. So this was when this region became French. Now, all the natives that were here, and I just love how they depict, you know, um, these native people sitting here and they look kind of like, what's this guy talking about? Anyway, he is proclaiming Louisiana for French, for France. So we become French. Uh, and this is the, I joke, the modest slice of North America that France took for themselves. Like, oh, we'll just take this wee little bit. And that's not to say that the French actually explored this whole region. There weren't a bunch of French explorers going out there, like putting up a, a, a you know, a sign, welcome to France. It was just that they claimed the river and then all the, the, the watershed of the Mississippi River. So this area becomes French in 1682. The French leave. They come back 17 years later. They start establishing the city of New Orleans in 1718. The city was established in 17... Um, uh, 19, the very following year, the French began bringing enslaved people here from Africa. So here's another another picture of that, trying to look at this. The slave ships bring enslaved people here beginning in 1719. And the idea was that they were going to have this like vast uh, tobacco plantations all over the region. This is going to be the French who had become addicted to British tobacco were thinking we're going to have our big tobacco farms and tobacco plantations. Turns out you can't grow tobacco here. So that didn't quite work out. Uh, and they build this little, little city and they call it La Nouvelle Orléans. And it's built right here at this bend in the river. And if you look, this is why we're called the Crescent City because we're built into this crescent moon shaped bend in the river. And then this right here is the village of Chapatulas. The natives uh, where the street Chapatulas gets its name today is named after the natives that live there. And that word means people that live by the river. So, uh, and this is actually where I am right now. I'm right around here where this word Chapatulas is written. Uh, it doesn't look like that anymore. And all of this was Cypress Swamp and all the people were crowded together there in the French Quarter. And it was pretty much an utter failure as a European colony. The French were here for 60 years, trying desperately to extract some kind of income, totally failing in every regard. They were growing flax and hemp and indigo, but no major cash crops. And then this is a mural that's on the flood wall on Chapatula Street, kind of depicting life um, through the years. Um, I don't know why my picture is so big. You used to be able to see most of the screen and now it's my big head in the way, like being at the movies sitting behind me. Um, anyway, so we were French for about 60 years. The French give the entire Louisiana territory to the Spanish in the 1760s. So this area becomes a Spanish colony, part of the vast Spanish colonial empire in North America. This was the Spanish region. Spanish are here for 40 years also totally failing, also never making a dime off the place. They give the whole thing to the French. So specifically to Napoleon. So a whole lot of things are happening right here at the same time. Probably Napoleon, I'm beginning to think more and more, although it was never really written down. Napoleon's intention was to have an empire in the new world. I mean, he was Napoleon after all. Like this guy thought he deserved everything and he was just going to conquer the world. And they had Haiti, which was Saint-Domingue. It was a French colony. And even though in 1800, when he acquired Louisiana, he was, the French were fighting the enslaved people who were rising up uh, in revolt against the French. Napoleon, no doubt, had complete confidence that he could take care of this little Saint-Domingue problem. And then he would once again have this big sugar empire, even though the French had outlawed slavery. And 
he was going to just reinstate it and they were going to be pumping all this sugar out of San Domingue and Louisiana was going to be like providing for San Domingue, which was going to be making all this sugar, make France rich. That is probably Napoleon's plan. However, things did not go as Napoleon planned um, because the enslaved people won and the Republic of Haiti was, was established. So so he's probably thinking, God, you know, I thought things would go differently and maybe I don't want to deal with, you know, a, a slavery and sugarcane and all of this, you know. And so in the meantime, Thomas Jefferson, the president of the United States, gets wind of the fact that Napoleon might want to unload his property and makes an offer to Napoleon to purchase what they call the Isle of Orleans, uh, meaning just that little area that, of, around New Orleans. And that's really, I think, all that Jefferson thought he had the, the budget for. Because this was a brand new, tiny little country. And so it was not really, they didn't really think they could acquire, I don't even think they tried to acquire any of that. They were simply wanting to get the Isle of Orleans because my bill is sitting around back there. Um, so they were trying to acquire, acquire the Isle of Orleans because Jefferson wanted to start trade with other countries. And the best way for trade was to have access to uh, the Mississippi River, because even the people that were growing things right here along the Mississippi River had to cross the Rockies to get stuff to the East Coast. So he knew that it'd be easier if the, um, those pants, <laughs> yes, he always, Napoleon had an interesting fashion sense. Um, and so uh, he knew that it'd be easier to go all the way down the river and then out to get things there. Plus you could trade with other countries. So Jefferson's in the market to buy New Orleans so that the Americans could access that river and go up and down that river. So he sends a couple of negotiators over to Aroni said, hi, Bill. Um, so he sends a couple of negotiators over to Paris to negotiate with Napoleon to purchase the Isle of Orleans. And Napoleon's like, guess what, guys? This is my deal. One deal, one deal only. And that is 15 million for the entire Louisiana territory, or it's no deal at all. So it was a good deal. The deal was struck. That's, of course, the Louisiana Purchase. This map that we're looking at right now is of the Louisiana Purchase. And that was 1803, and New Orleans becomes American. Now, in name, okay, in, in name, that you can change someone's citizenship with a stroke of a pen, but you it's hard to change their identity. So when the authorities come to New Orleans and tell all these people that lived here who were French-speaking, Catholic, Black, white, and mixed race, they call themselves Creole now, guess what? You're American. Yay. And they're like, no, I'm not American. You know, you can't just change the culture that's in someone's heart. So that is why even today, New Orleans feels different than any other American city. It's the way in which we became American. Nobody fought and died for their right to be an independent free country. It was just told to them, guess what? You know, Napoleon sold us. But in the early American period, we suddenly hit white gold at the expense of the enslaved people when they figured out a process for granulating sugar. And that's right here, like where Tulane and Loyola universities and Audubon Park, Audubon Zoo is on that plantation. Um, so, so a couple of things. First of all, we can now ship it out in the granulated form as opposed to molasses, which goes bad by the time it reaches destination. Sugar stays good all the way to Europe and we've got lots of lands to grow sugar. Plus, in Saint-Domingue and Haiti, they weren't producing the number amount of sugar that they had been doing under the French regime, brutalizing these African enslaved people. So Louisiana was like, oh, we can fill that gap. So we become the sugar producer. Louisiana becomes the sugar producer um, and still is to this day. And oh, the cotton gin is invented. So the cotton gin, Eli Whitney invents the cotton gin um, and... I like this picture because it depicts not only the gin, you know, and of course this is the enslaved people, you know, cranking that thing away. It it mechanically removes the seed from the cotton. That's all it does. And but that's hard work to remove a seed from every single ball of cotton for thousands of miles of cotton. Um, but now the machine does it, and so they grow in more cotton. They're loading it into this machine. Uh, it's a human machine that's like processing the cotton. And so it shows the plant and the and the picking and the processing. And then look, the two white guys like negotiating. So that's, that's really kind of depicts life, uh, the cotton plantations. Um, and then, oops, 
There is another hand cranked. And again, the white guys in the background do the negotiating. And then it got all the way up to these huge uh, warehouse size cotton gins. So cotton was this huge machine that was making the South. Cotton and sugar made us incredibly wealthy. So it was like all um, African people or African descended people in the warehouse and then all white people in the cotton office, buying, selling, trading. This is a painting by Edgar Degas uh, from 1872 called A Cotton Office in New Orleans. And it's actually the only painting that Degas ever sold um, it, to a museum in his lifetime. But these are his, his uncles and his cousins uh, in the cotton office. So anyway, we become very wealthy off of these crops. This is the cotton, the cotton market down on Canal Street. And uh, this is the steamboat. And the reason why there's much more beautiful pictures of steamboats, the reason why I picked this kind of pitiful depiction of a steamboat is because it's the first steamboat. And her name was New Orleans, and she came down the, city, down the river in 1812, and she transformed us into a major port city. So we become very, very, very wealthy. Eventually, they're piling the bales of cotton onto this uh, planta onto this um, steamboats, going up and down the river, and these white English-speaking Protestant Americans start flocking into New Orleans to make money off of sugar and cotton. Now, these guys weren't buying up plantations. I mean, sometimes they were buying up plantations, but generally they weren't buying plantations. They were the money men. Like these plantations were owned by French and Spanish families who had been living there for a hundred years, had been granted the land by the king of their country and had been trying to make it work for a hundred years. And suddenly they have the potential for these incredibly lucrative crops, but they don't really have the, um, a mural of the steamboat a few blocks from, from Roni. Oh, really cool. I'm going to have to go see that. I'm going to take a picture. Maybe that'll be my new picture on the slides. Um, and they don't really have the money to uh, invest to make the most of their crop. So here come these money men, right? Like New York, Philadelphia, Boston, Baltimore. Here you go. Here you go. You know, um, you know, buy some more land, buy more equipment, buy more slaves, uh, increase that production, become really, really rich. And um, and these are usually three to five year loans at 25 percent interest. So the loan, the lenders are making a lot of money. Then they become the cotton brokers, the cotton factors, like the people that they're, they're the middlemen between the plantation owner and whoever's buying the product. They set the price, they take a hefty commission, and they make millions more. So they're making a whole lot of money off of sugar and cotton without actually owning enslaved people, without actually owning plantations. And so that comes into play later on during the Civil War. But this was what the French Quarter looked like. This is what it looks like right now. These buildings were here before the Civil War. Um, this is Pirate's Alley, Spanish colonial architecture. Remember, the Spanish had burned the whole city down and rebuilt it in the Spanish colonial style. And uh, when the Americans start coming here, uh, they are all white, English-speaking, Protestant, wealthier, better educated. The people that are here are black, white, mixed race, French-speaking, and Catholic, and they've been here for 100 years. So this is a recipe for two groups not getting along. And they are like completely at odds. So the Americans are looking at the way that the Creoles look and they're like, oh my God, you know, big hot mess. These people are right up on top of each other. And we, we are better when we build our neighborhoods. Oh, it's just us. We're going to have something, you know, fancier. So um, this would be a typical, again, architectural style of the French Quarter with the beautiful courtyards behind every building. And this is a look of the French Quarter in the 50s. And if you look, and I'll, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change it a little bit because the thing is that you can park there. I think that's the biggest uh, difference. Um, and uh, they purchase a plantation. I'm going to just move this way. Let's see. There we go. You can see it very well. Okay, so you see down river down here is the French Quarter over on the right side of the screen. And then you go all the way up river. Let's see if I can get a better... Um, if I can get a better uh, cursor. No, I can't. Oh, there it is. Pointer. That's better. Okay. So down here is the French Quarter. And then up river a bit is the Livoudet Plantation. So the Americans, the newcomers, come up here and they purchase the Livoudet Plantation in 1826. And they finally get their wealthy American suburb to themselves. So it is... 
uh, going to be all American and we're going to speak English and we're going to lay it out nice and orderly. And it's going to be nothing like that big hot mess down there in the French Quarter, those people with their letting it all hang out and drinking and doing all the stuff that they do. Um, and so they bought the, the, the plantation from this lady and her name was Celeste de Marigny, the sister of the infamous Bernard de Marigny. Her family owned a downriver plantation. They were Creoles. They lived the plantation that is now the Faubourg Marigny. And um, she is married off at the age 13 uh, to a guy on the Lividay family, Jacques Lividay, who's probably in his late 20s, right? She's 13 years old. She's married to this guy. She hates him. He's a dog. He runs around. He gambles. He drinks. She's like, oh, if only I could figure out, if only I were old enough to figure out how to get rid of this guy. And so she didn't kill him, but she stayed married to him for several years, putting up with his mess. And then in 1826, she got a divorce. And this was almost unheard of. They were Catholic. They were rich. Everybody would say, you know, just live apart, you know. And she was like, no, I got to get rid of this guy. I don't want to be married to him anymore. So she gets a divorce. Now, the judge, so she, she appears before the judge. Jacques, her husband, never took her seriously. He's like, you'll never divorce me. She shows up to the divorce proceedings. He doesn't show up. The, the, the judge is insulted. And so he says to her, what do you want? And she says, I want $175,000 in cash and that plantation up there. So the judge gives her the plantation. And that's how she acquires the Lividay plantation. And then she flips it and sells it to the Americans for $450,000 in 1832 half a million bucks, and they put there, right here, city of Lafayette. So it was a separate suburb, it wasn't part of the city, and that was where the Americans settled in. And I will show you here this map of how they laid it out. And down here, we have this one block that's wider than any other block. And that is because Madame Lividay, oh, you can't see it, Oops, let me just flip again. That is because Madame Lividay was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to sell it to y'all, but I'm not completely letting go of the idea of one day having a big, beautiful plantation home right on the river. So I'll tell you what, you can have it. Leave me this little area where I might come back and build my house. If I die and don't come back, you can have it. It's yours, but you got to save that little area for me. And so as, as specific and uh, factual and square that the Americans wanted to be. You can see that they laid it out in a very orderly fashion, except for one block, which is still to this day, the widest block in the garden district. She never came back. She never uh, built her house. And, um, and so they eventually got to keep it, but uh, that is where the cemetery is in that wide block right now. So anyway, this is a better map. This show a nice clear map from a book called the, uh, the great days of the garden district. Yes, the grand days of the garden district. And this shows you in relation where the French quarter is and then where the city of Lafayette was and the garden district was part of the city of Lafayette. And then this part would be the Irish channel now. So anyway, they built entirely different houses. Oh, Carla, you missed the first part. You'll be happy to hear now. And it's gonna be on our website. It's gonna be on our Facebook page. It'll be still be on there. And then this is um, this is very typical architecture of the Garden District, clearly very different from the French Quarter and 100% on purpose. Okay, they did not want to look like the French Quarter. They're going to the classics, to the Greeks. Greek revival is the earliest architecture style. Big houses set far back from the street. It separates you from visually separates you and makes you apart from you know all the filthy unwashed masses out there. So we um, we end up with a neighborhood that's very very beautiful, but in an entirely different way than the beauty of the French Quarter. And then this one right here is the um, it's the uh, Buckner Mansion. The Buckner Mansion is anybody that writes watches American Horror Story season three coven this is where the witches go to school this is a, a house a uh, privately owned home on jackson avenue but it was built in the 1850s by a man named henry buckner and that was his home so again these people are not being discreet about their wealth they're like go big or go home let's show how much money we have and that was definitely the aesthetic there whereas the creoles had different ways of showing off their wealth um, and privacy. So they definitely want to put their houses back from the street a bit. They don't, they're not like right up on the street. You can't walk past the house in the garden district and hear what's going on inside the house. Whereas in the French quarter, you can, and I do frequently, it's one of my 
favorite pastimes. Uh, and this is a house on, um, on uh, St. Charles Avenue, which actually belonged to Sophronie Claiborne, who was the daughter of uh, W.C.C. Claiborne, the first American governor of Louisiana, and a rabid American he was. So, And then this is a fence in the Garden District. So that's a very distinctive feature, too. The fence is beautiful, and it's a way to show off how much money you have, but it's also a separation between you and the people out there. So they were definitely going for a different look. This particular fence is a cornstalk motif. They call it the Cornstalk Fence Mansion. There's a hotel in the French Quarter called the Cornstalk Fence Hotel. The legend is that the man who owned this house was from Louisiana, but his wife was from fill in the blank, someplace where they grow corn, Iowa, whatever, and that she was so lonesome for home, like, oh, I miss the cornfields in my home state. There's no corn here. You didn't tell me there was no corn in Louisiana. And so he just put up this fence. He's like, here's your damn corn. Uh, no, uh, it's usually told as a bit more uh, romantic. So this romantic husband had this fence commission so that his wife could look out the windows and think about the cornfields of good old Iowa. It's not true. It was out of a catalog out of Philadelphia. It was the most expensive fence in the catalog. And so that's what he was showing is how much money he had. And I think I'll do another one of these about that house because it has a lot of great history to it. This is a close up of the, um, the motif in a house that what most people call the uh, Brevard Rice House because Anne Rice, the vampire writer, lived there. And that's like a little close up, which is interesting because it looks a little bit like skulls um, in, in her house. Uh, and the way that they got to and from work was um, by the Mule Drawn Streetcar, which is the exact same route as the St. Charles Avenue Streetcar today. But it was mule drawn. So the mules were pulling the streetcars. They were still had tracks because like an omnibus was really bumpy, the tracks just made the ride smoother and a mule was pulling it. They added electricity around 1890s. Um, and so all of this is going, they're making a lot of money. They're commuting to the French Quarter. Subtitles bleaked out the word damn. Oh, that's so funny. Uh, <laughs> uh, really prudish the subtitles, excuse me. So uh, anyway, the Civil War comes along and ends this. And of course, the Civil War, we all know the issue was slavery. And we were the Confederacy, the South, the Southern planters were participating completely in this brutal, brutal system of slavery because they were making so much money. They were just um, justifying it to themselves and continuing along. The North had um, abolished slavery. Some The Northern states had abolished slavery some time ago. And so the North and the South went to war. And New Orleans was considered a prize. Um, uh, whoever controlled New Orleans controlled the trade up and down the Mississippi River. So the Union Army saw it as a desired location to to uh, grab because then they would be able to um, kind of choke out the rest of the South. So Louisiana was occupied by the Union beginning in 60, 1861. And this graph is really interesting because I don't know if you can see across the top, but it says sugar crop in Louisiana from 1861 to 1860 or 1860 to 1865. So right here, 18, April of 1861, the first shot was fired on Fort Sumter and the Civil War broke out. And, and, and the people in Louisiana were like, oh, war, schmoor. We're just going to keep on going. We're going to be fine. We're going we're gonna to make some money. We're going to come out of this fine. Uh, uh, it did not end that way. Uh, they were pumping away. And then the Union Army occupies Louisiana in April of 1862. And their economy plummets. And then eventually goes to nothing. And so the whole region became very impoverished. They weren't even allowed to produce sugar. I mean, of course, there was the fact that the enslaved people, you know, were freed, but the Union Army had to not allow Louisiana to produce sugar because they needed them not to have an economy. They needed to stay economically depressed or else they would have tried to rise back up again. The Civil War would have gone on and on and on. So things ended up pretty bad as they were but they probably would have been even worse for even longer, if you can imagine that. Um, so we become really impoverished. And this is the image that all of our grandmothers had of how we all lived in the South, poor cotton fields. And it was a largely deserved reputation because we were, you know, we were pretty impoverished. I think New Orleans probably did a little bit better than the rest of the Deep South because we still had the port and we had immigration. But this was a pretty economically depressed region for quite some time. Um, this was what the French Quarter started to look like. And there is a little kid literally playing in the gutter, 
probably eight to 10 families live in this poor tenement building in the French Quarter. The French Quarter become a bit of a slum uh, because the townhouses in the French Quarter were owned by plantation owning families. So 1,200 sugar plantations between New Orleans and Baton Rouge before the Civil War, every single one of those families would have also had a house in town. So the French Quarter becomes really, really impoverished because these people lost everything. And so the whole French Quarter becomes really, really poor. And you don't have to guide, have to have a guide to see that it's had its economic ups and downs. You can just tell by walking around in the French Quarter the courtyards begin to look like this. And I'm sure now this courtyard is really, really pretty. And there's a bunch of condos upstairs and an art gallery downstairs. But this would have been um, what the French Quarter looked like, pretty much a slum. The Garden District, however, remained pretty well to do because these people didn't own plantations. And they may have owned enslaved people, but not very many. Mostly they had like Irish indentured servants and German servants. Um, but um, they had to find new ways of making money, but they were by no means destitute. So the Garden District has always remained, you know, a very beautiful, uh, very well-kept neighborhood. It's never really experienced those uh, times of immense poverty. So anyway, that is sort of my, that's usually what my introduction to my online Garden District tour is. But I just thought I would share y'all, share that with y'all tonight to kind of give you an idea about the early days of the Garden District and how it came to be a distinctive neighborhood that it is. And then hopefully, we will be able to um, talk some more about the Garden District. We have lots of slides of lots of beautiful homes in the Garden District that we can talk about. And uh, so thanks for joining me, everyone. If you don't already like us on Facebook, please like us on Facebook because I'll be doing a lot of these. And uh, have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy your cocktails. Enjoy your books. Enjoy everything that you're doing. And I hope to see everybody again really soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.